Good morning, and welcome to the 2020 North Central Diocese Convention Sunday Morning Worship Service, which we are led by our presiding bishop, Bishop Lindsay Jones. Our program will include praise and worship, the preach word by Bishop Jones, a closing song selection, and closing remarks. Please enjoy the service. Clap our hands. Yeah. Clap your hands, all ye people. And we're going to shout out to God with a voice of triumph. Amen.
Good morning and uh, welcome to this 2020 North Central Diocese Convention closing message. The North Central Diocese Convention's headquarters is here at the Christ Temple Cathedral, St. Louis, Missouri at 4301 Page Boulevard. It was the psalmist who said, I was glad when they said unto me, let us go into the house of the Lord. 
And I am glad to uh, welcome you on today as we consider the Word of God. So if you would, would you take your Bibles and I invite your attention to the Old Testament book of Isaiah. Isaiah's prophecy, chapter 6. And would you follow along with me as I read in your hearing verses 1 through 5. Isaiah chapter 6, verse 1 through 5 reads as follows in the New King James translation of God's word that says, In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord sitting on a throne, high and lifted up, and his train or robe filled the temple. Above it stood the seraphim. Each one had six wings. With two he covered his face, with two he covered his feet, and with two he flew. Verse 3 says, And one cried to another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. Verse 4, And the posts of the door were shaken by the voice of him who cried out, and the house was filled with smoke. So I said, woe is me, for I am undone because I am a man of unclean lips and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. For my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. Today would like to speak to you from the subject when catastrophe comes. Uh, when a catastrophe comes. And as a sub-thought or subtitle would be this, what holiness has to do with it. When catastrophe comes, what holiness has to do with it. The depending, the discovering, and the dealing. When catastrophe comes. One day there was a college professor who was grading some uh, papers while he was riding on a commuter train. Accidentally, he bumped his large cup of coffee and he ended up spilling the entire contents into his open briefcase. The coffee splash ended up being so dramatic that it could not be ignored. And uh, there was another man sitting next to him. And uh, this is what the man sitting next to him shouted out real loudly. He said, worst possible disaster, worst possible disaster. Well, later on, the teacher admitted that his nearby passenger's reaction was an obvious overstatement. And I would agree. But did you know there are times in life when we find ourselves engulfed in catastrophic circumstances that do indeed qualify for the label worst possible disaster. There are times we find ourselves in life and the fallout from a situation and the consequences we wish that they were limited to some coffee-stained papers in a professor's briefcase. But the truth of the matter is the situation is far more serious and far more 
dire. And here in our text, in Isaiah chapter 6, the prophet pulls back the curtain on one such catastrophic disaster that ended up rocking the nation at this time. And it not only was a catastrophe for the nation, but it rocked Isaiah's life as well. First of all, when the catastrophe comes, there are three great opportunities. The first opportunity is uh, for you and I, we need to depend on something. And uh, what we need to depend on is that when catastrophe comes, we need to depend on the exclusive sovereignty of God's hand. When catastrophe comes, God's hand is still at work. Because look what uh, uh, he says uh, uh, in, in verse 1. Again, he says, in the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord. Oh, yes, sir. Yes, ma'am. He said as, as, as horrible as that year was, an opportunity came about for me to see God like I'd never seen God before. But look what he says. He saw the Lord. He said that I saw the Lord. He was sitting on a throne. Not only did I see the Lord and he was sitting on a throne, but I saw the Lord and he was high and lifted up. The first thing Isaiah noticed was God's exalted position. It was not only where God was situated, he was situated high and lifted up. But he noticed that God was sitting as well. Oh, God was elevated above and God was occupying the throne. In those days and actually these days as well, the throne always symbolized the seat of power. In those days and these days, whoever sits on the throne, that's the source of authority. Who's ever sitting on the throne? It was also not just a symbol of the seat of power. It was not only uh, made it clear where the source of authority was, but oh my goodness gracious, whoever sat on the throne, it was evident that's the one who's in control. Well, Isaiah's discovered this, he discovered that although King Uzziah's throne on the earth may be empty, guess what God said to Isaiah? King Jesus was still on the throne in heaven. And I agree with the person who said that who is on the throne matters more than who is in the White House. Let me, let me repeat that. Who's on the throne this morning matters more than who is in the White House. I want you to know this morning that who is on the throne matters more than who occupies the governor's mansion. Who is on the throne this morning matters more than who rules in City Hall. And if there's anything you and I need to remember in these difficult times in which we live, not only is God still on the throne, but as long as God still occupies the throne in heaven, and he does and he always will, God this morning, he's the one who is sovereignly in control. If there's one word that I hear the most to describe the times in which we live, especially this coronavirus, it's the one word unprecedented. It's unprecedented because mankind is clueless about its cause. Uh, don't know where it came from or its origin was a lab in China or the throne room in heaven. Uh, not only is it's, uh, uh, mankind is clueless, mankind is perplexed about its cure. 
still traveling so much uh, uh, that still say they're moving as fast as they can, but don't know when a cure will be here. But third, what makes it so unprecedented is that is the chaos. Life has been so disrupted. And uh, one of the things about mankind and humankind is any time we are not in control, it messes us up. Yes, it is. We're used to being in control. We're used to being able to figure it out. We're used to be able to come up with a solution. But one of the things, whether it's what's going on in the streets or what's going on when it comes to the other issues, uh, it is something when we as humans can't figure it out. But the good news today is that when a disaster comes, we need to depend on the exclusive sovereignty of God's hand. And when we talk about the exclusive sovereignty of God's hand, I want to declare this morning, God may or may not be the direct cause of certain catastrophes. Listen to me. But God, whether he is the cause or not, God is absolutely, God is sovereignly still in control. And not only is God still in control, I, I believe the word of God in Romans chapter uh, the Romans chapter 8 verse 28 that says that God works all things together for good to them that love God, to them who are called according to his purpose. Now that verse did not say that all things are good, but my friend, uh, the reality is there are some things in life that are absolutely bad. Oh, when I think about some things in life are bad, I'm talking about actually bad. I like how Aaron Sharp put it in his excellent book on the life of Elijah. Uh, he calls it, I didn't sign up for this. He says most of us truly believe in God's purposes until something goes bad. Not, I can't find a parking Space at the grocery store, bad, but really bad. Hearing the word chemo, bad. Looking at a closed casket and knowing the loved one's body is inside, bad. A broken relationship that will never get repaired, bad. But I want you to know that God is a God who's sovereign. He's in control. And whether it's cancer bad, whether it's death bad, whether it's broken relationship bad, we serve a God who is situated in the heavens. We serve a God who is sitting in control on the throne. And as long as there is life, in our bodies, breath in our lungs, we can depend this morning on the fact that we serve a God who is sovereignly in control. Before I move on, I am reminded that there was a ship that was being tossed and turned so many different ways. And uh, everyone aboard the ship was, was understandably upset and afraid. Well, there was a little girl that was, they found asleep on the uh, lower level of the ship and they came and knocked on the door of her cabin and they uh, found her asleep and they said, uh, uh, young lady, aren't you afraid? And how in the world can you sleep while the ship is going through the storm? Little girl looked up at the man and said, well, sir, uh, the reason I can still sleep is that my father is the captain of the ship. And as long as my father is the captain of the ship, I know we're in good hands. Well, if that young girl could find that she could depend on her father, as long as her father's hands were on that wheel, I want us to know today that we can depend 
on the exclusive sovereignty of God's hands. And so when catastrophe comes, it is a great opportunity to depend on the exclusive sovereignty of God's hands. Second, uh, when catastrophe comes, we need to not only depend on something, but oh, when catastrophe comes, uh, when our world is turned upside down, uh, when we find ourselves in those bad, bad, really bad situations, not only depend on the exclusive sovereignty of God's hand, but second, when catastrophe comes, God wants us to discover something. And not only discover something, I want to say God wants us to discover someone. And in verse 2, we find the someone that God wants us to discover. And that is uh, when catastrophe comes, we need to discover the essence of God's holiness, the essence of God's holiness, because God's holiness is the centerpiece of his very character. Because if you look in verse 2 again, uh, at the end of verse uh, 1 again, it says uh, that uh, God was sitting on the throne. We'll come back to he was uh, high and lifted up in his train uh, of his robe filled the temple. But look at verse 2 says, verse 2 says, and above it seraphim, which were angelic beings, seraphim, each one had six wings with two wings. These angelic beings, they covered their face with another set of wings. These are beings covered their feet and then with the third set of wings, these angelic beings suspended or maintained their flight. And so again, with two, they covered their face. With two, they covered their feet. With two wings, they flew. But it was not only what they were doing, but more important, look at verse 3. Verse 3 says what? They were singing out what they were crying out, what they were proclaiming. And verse three says, and one cried to the other as they were singing back and forth to one another. They began to sing out, holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts and the whole earth is full of his glory. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. And I agree with one commentator who said that uh, not only reminds us that God's holiness is the centerpiece of his very character, that is who he is. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. But since God's holiness is the centerpiece of his character, did you know that all his other attributes flow from that one characteristic? And it's not accidental uh, that they say it holy, holy, holy three times. Yes, God is a God of wrath against sin, but even then, that wrath is holy. I've already mentioned that God is a sovereign God, but God's sovereignty over the universe is a holy sovereignty. Oh, God is a loving God, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. God's love for this world is a holy love. Overall and above and beyond everything else, if God is anything this morning, God is holy, so much so, if the first thought 
that comes to your mind when you hear the word holy. If the first thought that comes to your mind when you hear the word holiness, if it is anything or even anyone but God himself, I want to suggest you really do not understand uh, what it means, what the word holy really means. Because uh, the word holy is it describes who God is. Holy is not only the substance of who he is. But God's holiness is not only the centerpiece of his character, but holy and holiness is what sets God apart into a category all by himself. In other words, uh, when it comes to God being holy, uh, it means that there is no one, there is nothing but God only is holy. Matter of fact, uh, uh, one day or even uh, as I share the word of God in Isaiah chapter 40, verse 25, this is what this same Isaiah says. The same Isaiah, of course, who wrote chapter 6, wrote chapter 40. And in chapter 40, verse 25, this is what uh, Isaiah says that God says. God says, to whom then will you liken me or to whom shall I be equal, says the Holy One. Do you notice God it says, uh, there is none like me. There is none equal to me. There is no one to be compared with me. I am in a category all by myself, and it is because I am holy. And overall, I want to say to us is that uh, sometimes uh, uh, we, we, we think of all kinds of things uh, when it comes to holy uh, holiness. But I want you to know that it is the very character and essence of God. And one of the greatest things that someone who is committed to personal holiness should be committed to is that we are to have a desire to enjoy and be passionate about the presence of God. In other words, let me may get in trouble here, but understand what I'm saying. It is important when it comes to personal holiness that we are committed to living uh, a holy life, which we usually have in mind, a clean, upright life. But I want you to know that that is a byproduct or that is a indication of holiness. But oh, at the heart of holiness is that I love the Lord God who is holy. Uh, and I, I believe it's important that more and more we make this distinction that there must be a passionate love for the God who is holy and not just be satisfied with right living. Now, again, understand, man, we, 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 we ought to live right. We ought to live clean, upright lives. But sometimes, did you know what I call the bow ties and bean pies gang or someone else has referred to them that way they often live clean lives as well yes they do some sometimes uh uh when i look at uh, their lives uh they look clean and when it comes to doing the right thing as it relates with being a a moral uh the bow ties and bean pies gang so so often they'll live what they consider clean lives uh sometimes the Knocking on your doors on Saturday group. They also at times may live a moral lifestyle. Uh, sometimes I believe even they're walking in black neighborhoods, but they're definitely not from the hood group. Uh, they also 
live nice life. You, 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 I won't call the names, obviously, but you know what I'm referring to. Uh, not only are there the bow ties and the bean pies gang, there's not only the knocking on your doors on Saturday morning group, there's not only the walking in the black neighborhood uh, uh, group, but then there is the everybody in the Bible is black, including Jesus is black gang. Uh, again, y'all get this later on. Uh, and, and they too, many of them, uh, live in a clean life, uh, mean what you eat and what you don't eat, but the problem with many of these so-called groups is that they may be committed to a lifestyle, but there is no commitment to the Lord Jesus Christ who we worship, who said, I am the way, I am the truth, I am the life. No man comes to the Father but through me, and there is no not a passion for the presence of the God who is holy. And I just want to say as I prepare to move on is that one of the greatest opportunities that we have is to not only depend on the sovereignty of God, but also to discover the holiness of God. The third And last, when it comes, when catastrophe comes, we need to depend on something. And that is the sovereignty of God's hand. When catastrophe comes and disaster comes, we need to also discover the God who is holy. But if you look at verse 1 and verse 3 and a part of verse 4, we need to not only depend, we need to not only discover, but we also need to deal with something. And that is we need to deal with, I want to say, the emptiness of our hearts. The emptiness of our hearts. And when I say the emptiness of our hearts, I mean that did you know that God's fullness for our emptiness is the deepest need of the human heart? Because uh, would you look, uh, look, look, look back at verse one again, uh, verse uh, the first part of verse one says again, in the year the king of Zion died, I, I, I saw the Lord. He was sitting on the throne high and lifted up. But watch this. And the train of his word of his robe filled. The temple. God filled the temple. Uh, Look at verse 3. The latter part of verse 3. Not only did they uh, cry, holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts, but they said the whole earth is full of his glory. The train of his robe filled the temple. His glory was, it filled the whole earth. Uh, look even uh, also uh, at uh, verse 4. Verse 4 says, And the posts of the door were shaken by the voice of him who cried out, and the house was filled with smoke. You may say, what's the big deal? I declare it's not accidental that the word fill. It's not accidental that the word fool. It's not accidental uh, that it says three or four times that God in his fullness, was addressing the emptiness of not only mankind's heart, but I believe with all my heart that is saved, is sanctified, and is filled with the Holy Ghost as Isaiah was, a leading man of God. There was something about the disaster, something about life that had left his heart empty and friends uh, there are times that you and I and yes we are saved yes we are sanctified but we are struggling with emptiness in our lives emptiness in our heart and what God did for Isaiah is to let Isaiah know that I am not only a God who's holy I'm not only a God who's high and lifted up, but I am a God who specializes in 
filling empty hearts, filling empty souls, bringing satisfaction in life. And it was only because Isaiah, it says at the end of verse 5, for my eyes have seen the king. Isaiah began to see himself like he'd never seen himself before. And I agree with the person who said that even those of us who know the Lord, uh, listen a moment, even those of us who know the Lord, we can often allow the activities and things of life, and we remain so busy that uh, even it can contribute to emptiness in our lives. Uh, what one person says, we live in an age of extreme busyness, and possibly not one person in this room needs one more meeting to attend, one more job to do, one more activity to take part in. Our lives can be arguably so overloaded. And while, listen now, the person says, while our schedules remain full, our lives can feel empty. One of the concerns that I, either I have, I've noticed more and more, of course, uh, as a result of this, uh, uh, what has happened with this uh, coronavirus. Uh, for a period of time, we were shut down, sheltered in, and shut in. And many folks and most folks, by the grace of God, escaped the COVID fever. Not everybody, obviously, but ended up with another kind of fever, and that is cabin fever, okay? Uh, they uh, skipped, by the grace of God, was spared from one ailment, but now there's cabin fever and become stir-crazy, and at the heart of that is simply that many folks have had to face themselves, oh, glory to God, like they've never faced themselves before. And I want to proclaim to us that there is an opportunity that God wants you and God wants me to doing these times of shut in, doing these times of being shut down, I'm not sure that God is not up to something and that what God wants to do is for us to become shut in with him while we are shut down from all the other things. See, uh, some of us, I didn't say all of us, but some of us, you know, we used to zoom from this place to that place in the air and in a car and guess what we're doing now? We're just zooming right now from Zoom meeting to Zoom meeting, from conference call to conference call. And, and, uh, and obviously nothing wrong with the technology and even this message comes to you via that way. But I am not sure that sometimes even the enemy will take good things. And I appreciate the testimony from one national leader who said that during the period when he could not go out and could not go any place, it was that time that God spoke to him and began to minister to him and forced him to slow down as the word of God says, be still and know that I am God. And Isaiah had to face something in his own life. And not only, yes, he had to face sin in his own life, but he had to also face the emptiness and the lack of satisfaction. And what I want to say is that during this time, we need to not only uh, depend on God, not only discover that God is holy, but God wants us to uh, be willing to deal with something and that is that even though we know the Lord, God wants us to be filled afresh with his spirit. Oh, there are many tremendous songs by our founder, the great Charles Price Jones. But one of them is where the songwriter says, I want to be filled 
with the spirit of glory, filled with the spirit of love. I want the bright wings of the Lord hovered o'er me, wings of Jehovah above. That third verse says this promise, O Savior, now haste thee to grant me. Fill me, O, oh, fill me, I pray. O, oh, let not the world nor Satan prevent thee. Grant me, what does the songwriter say? Grant me the fullness today. I am not satisfied as long as I am denied. The promise of heaven, the Holy Ghost given, I am not satisfied. Here's our close. I'm reminded one day there was this uh, back in the days where molasses was made and stored in a huge barrel. This little boy somehow fell into this barrel of molasses. Now, you can imagine how sticky it was. You can imagine how messy it was. You can imagine uh, the discomfort of it all. But this was that little boy's prayer in the midst of what seemingly was a disaster. He said, Lord, give me the capacity to match up with this opportunity. Lord, give me the capacity to match up with this opportunity. In other words, he realized, yeah, as messy as it was, as bad as it was, he realized how sweet it was. He realized he had fallen into something good. And rather than saying, Lord, why did you let this happen to me? He said, Lord, Help me to turn this bad situation and give me the capacity to enjoy this molasses like never before. Well, I want you to know that in the midst of whatever personal situation and crisis you may be facing, whether it's your physical challenges, whether it's your job challenges, whether it's your family challenges, when bad things happen to good people, God wants you to depend on something. Would you depend on the fact that God is Still in control. His eye is on the clock. His hand is on the thermostat. God knows how much you can handle and he knows how long. So would you depend? On the sovereignty of his hand. You may not know who's in control, but I want you to know God is in control. Would you use this time to discover him and his holiness like never before? But would you use this time to deal with the emptiness and slow down? Yes, it is me saying slow down because God wants us to be still and know that he is God. And would you take advantage of this opportunity to Go up in your walk with God, despite what may be going on at this time in your life. Would you join me in prayer as we ask God to help us to turn disaster into the God-ordained opportunities that he desires. Father God, thank you, Lord God. You know how this has and is a year that we will remember. And it's only half over. It will be here when we remember that when this died and that died and when this was disrupted and that was disrupted. But thank you, Lord, that we can see you like we've never seen and experienced you before. I pray, I pray. We pray, Lord God, for the one who has been so worried and they feel their life is out of control. But Lord God, we don't know what the future holds, but we know who holds the future, oh God. And so would you stabilize our hearts and minds, oh God, because you're in control. Oh, Lord God, give us a hunger 
for you, O oh God, because you are the God who is holy and you are the only God who deserves our worship, our praise. And then, Lord, help us to deal, O oh God, with emptiness in our own lives. And rather than speeding up and trying to accomplish more and more, Lord God, you may be calling us to be still and know that you're God. You are true to your word. Draw near to you. And you will draw near to us. It's in your name we pray and ask it all. Amen. Amen. Thank you for hearing and receiving the word of God this morning. If you do not know the Lord Jesus as your personal Savior, he said that I came that you might have life and that you might have it more abundantly. Would you receive him as your personal Savior? And if you already know him as your Savior, would you know that he wants you to use this time in life as an opportunity to grow closer to him? God bless you. We wish you God's best upon behalf of the entire mighty North Central Diocese of the Church of Christ Holiness USA. We thank God for you. And would you continue to trust the God who's the only true God and who's worthy of our praise. This is our prayer for you in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. Thank you for joining us for the 2020 North Central Diocese Convention Sunday morning service. We pray God's blessing on you for the rest of this year. Thank you. Be blessed. Oh.